of Mozilla, who will be accompanied by the young entrepreneurs backed by Think Big program of Telefonica. And they will talk and discuss the importance of being able to make the web in an entrepreneurial journey. Please welcome Mark Simon. Hi guys, how you doing? Enjoying Canvas Party? Um, so as I said, I'm going to talk about making the web, which is something I talk about quite a bit, um, but specifically in the context of entrepreneurship and some work we're doing together with Telefonica and Think Big. And really, you know, the kind of thing I want to talk about is this. For me, this is actually the pinnacle of what I love about the web, and inside of this is actually a kind of theme of entrepreneurship, a theme of learning, uh, and a theme of actually changing the world, even if you don't think that Psy or SpongeBob have changed the world. But I'll get to why. But think about Psy, SpongeBob, and changing the world as we get into this theme of making the web. And there's three parts to what I want to talk about. In the, in the kind of changing the world part, but also a bit of what to me is entrepreneurship, which is a person or a group of people with a big idea making it real, I want to tell the story of Mozilla. And I'll get from there to where the web is now, where learning, where ambition and entrepreneurship fit in. But I want to go back in history, because it just tells you a little bit about who Mozilla is and why we do the things that we do. And so to do that, I need to take it back to 2003, which is when Mozilla Foundation itself was incorporated. And I don't know how many people remember 2003. Some of you guys are so young, you probably can't remember it. Uh, Richard clearly does. Uh, so so to, to bring you back a little bit, some th events of 2003, the space shuttle exploded. Not so awesome. I don't know if people remember SARS. You couldn't fly anywhere. It was a, it was a kind of bad year. But you know what was really bad in 2003? This was your web browser. And I, I say that a little bit in jest, but the web was very different in 2003. Most of us were online, but one company and one piece of software was the only way that you could really see the web, uh, and it was Internet Explorer. And you know, it's, it's not particularly that I'm a Microsoft detractor that I say that. It's because the web itself was actually quite shit in 2003 because there wasn't choice and there wasn't innovation. So if you think back to 2003, how many people remember webmail like that? Where if you wanted to re, you know, see if a new mail had come in, you just hit reload, 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 reload. The web changed a lot since 2003. Uh, it's because the software we use to access it changed. How many people also remember seeing these? pop up. And that again was, there was no choice. There was only one way to see the web, really. 98% of people were using Internet Explorer, and that was Microsoft. And this, these boxes popped up because they had started to change how the core technologies of the web, like HTML, worked. So you, there were versions of, of things that only worked in their browser. Uh, and so also in 2003, a very entrepreneurial group of people, this group of people, got together uh, and decided to take the Mozilla project, which had been working as an open source browser project for five years, turn it into Mozilla Foundation, and build Firefox. And in particular, you've got Mitchell Baker in the green and Brendan Eich in the, looking very young in the leather jacket uh, beside them, who are the two co-founders of Mozilla, and to me, some of the most amazing social entrepreneurs that I've ever met. Uh, and really have changed the world. And how did they do it? How did that group of people, and, and Mitchell and Brendan leading them, go from the world of the web in 2003 to the web that we have today? Well, to give you a sense of what happened, this was browser market share in 2003. Uh, and so the blue was Internet Explorer, and it doesn't quite tell you that it actually really was about 98% of people who were seeing the web were seeing it through Internet Explorer and through that kind of limited set of capabilities, well, which I guess all browsers had at the time, but certainly were shaped by uh, IE. And what happened, and this is 2009, it's even more different today, is that, start, that changed quite dramatically. So that group of entrepreneurial people you saw was quite successful. You can see it's just about 10, 15 people uh, in moving the world in a way where it, there was choice. 
it's not important really that Firefox, which is the orange, becomes uh, such a significant f force. Actually, it's more interesting if you saw this graph today uh, where there's lots of choice. There's choice between Chrome, between Safari, between Firefox, between IE. And in that, that has really driven the web forward and the technology of the web forward because there's competition and choice. And the interesting part of this story, though, is not that 15 people took on the biggest software company in the world, uh, which they did. Uh, and it's not that they reached their goals. Uh, it's the way they did it. And the way they did it was not to have the 15 people just in a startup um, you know, toiling away, although they were that. Uh, it was to actually use community and to actually use the power of open source as a way, as leverage, as a way to move things. And so you can actually see there's hundreds and thousands of volunteers, of student reps who you see here, of people doing online support for free, of people translating the software. Firefox comes out in about 80 languages in every release, all through, volunteers, uh, all through volunteer localizers. Uh, and then you've got beta testers, and then the people who are using Firefox. And it was that vision that we can work together in making the web that allowed Mozilla to be successful uh, and allowed us to shift the market. And what's critical when you think about these people, which is the, the same folks you saw before, actually becoming this group of people, which is the Mozilla community, that's about half volunteers at our summit in 2010, is they really were focused you know, on a clear set of values and purpose, but with a pragmatism that the only way that their vision of the web, which was that it would be open, but also would grow in its capabilities, would be as serious as a platform, as, as the desktop, uh, the only way their vision of the web and their values could become real is if they took that market share. So it's a very different kind of community project than many people you know, have seen elsewhere, is they're very realistic that they needed influence, they needed relevance in order to have that impact of shaping the world to be as they saw it. And you know, it, it really uh, did happen, right? If you think back to 2003, of the, the things you use every day on the internet, if you think about the top 10 Alexa sites, the only one that existed in 2003 really was Wikipedia. Now, how many people use these other things? Right? There are things that didn't exist in 2003 partly because the, the web platform was not ready to do email well. It was making you reload and reload. The web platform was not ready to do Facebook, was not ready to start to do games that we're starting to see happen in HTML5. What Firefox did was it allowed things like Ajax, allowed interactive technology that made applications like this popular to start to become something that everybody had. It pushed Microsoft to change its behavior and adopt newer parts of the web standards. It uh, pushed web standards forward and created openings for things like Chrome and Safari. And it itself became a leader in making the technology modern, which is the reason that today we can do so many of the things we do on the web, as opposed to just having crappy web mail where we hit reload, reload, reload. And so that was the impact that they wanted to have, which is actually going even farther today beyond just those apps that we think of as kind of you know, common, the web is this new set of emerging standards under the banner of HTML5 that is going to make the web be a platform competitive with any other platform, uh, including all of the different mobile operating systems. So that's the vision they had. And that's as a set of entrepreneurs that galvanize community what they were able to make happen. And of course, they also can take credit for this. Uh, which is important because this is the popular culture that comes of anybody being able to make the web, which is not that different than the popular culture or the, the impulse behind Facebook or making open source software. So that's the second part of what I want to talk about, is a cultural shift that has happened with the web, which I think is positive, uh, but not necessarily durable or sustainable, is very much a shift towards a, a maker can do culture. And I think that's interesting in terms of entrepreneurship, that that attitude of a maker can do culture is something that comes in a lot of our experience of the web. We don't maybe think about it as being the thing that would make us an entrepreneur or make us somebody who's a good team member in a company, but it actually is. And for me, that's a, a thing 
which is really powerful about the web, really exciting about the cultural transformation the web has made, uh, and is something we actually want to preserve and exploit in terms of making our societies better, including making more entrepreneurs and making more jobs. And so let's just look at where the web has gone uh, since, that, you know, since that Firefox market share shifter. Where is the web today? And how does that learning piece fit into what we need to address? So how's the web doing 10 years after that 2003? Well, you know, in some ways, it's, it's doing awesome, right? We all have the web in our pockets. How many people have the internet in their pocket in some way right now? So five years ago, that would be very few of us. Um, and you know, we would have thought it was never going to happen, certainly 10 years ago, uh, that we'd all have these advanced apps in our pockets. And that's actually great. I mean, it's shiny, and it's good, and it does cool stuff. And I have two Android phones in my coat. I mean, it's not to detract it. But it also is shifting back, in some ways, towards that IE world, in that we have two vendors who control the whole app distribution marketplace, control who can submit an app or distribute video content or distribute books, and also where they control the authoring environment. They control who can produce what and how, which whether you think what they do is great or not is a limit on innovation, which is exactly the kind of limit on innovation that the web removed in the first place. And if you just think about diversity as a value, which I do, you think about that there's 900,000 iPhone apps, but there's 200 million domain names. What you want is a world that is that diverse, because that's where innovation, new ideas, and the freedom to innovate come from. So you know, that's the reason that one of the things that we're doing, including with Telefonica, uh, is promoting a mobile operating system that is based on the web, that'll make it easier for there to be 200 million apps or anyone to make an app, uh, as well as using that to push forward HTML5 as a standard for how all mobile works or how things work across all your devices uh, on the web. And so that's one thing Mozilla is doing with where the web is it now. But we actually think, in addition to that challenge, which is not dissimilar from the challenge that uh, we faced in 2003, the other challenge is that we really don't know what is possible with this stuff. And so if you think about, and we may all, in fact, Campus Party is probably filled with people who do, but most people, while they have this power in their pocket, aren't aware of what all is possible. They know, in fact, they probably know more than they think, but they think they don't know how to code, they don't know how to create, they don't know how to seize the power of what they have available to them. So we did a survey with YouGov here in the UK last year where we asked kids and parents about uh, what their tech skills are, what do they want to know. And 3% of British teenagers, I think, yeah, between 8 and 15, uh, said they knew how to code. 67% said they want it. So there's a big gap in empowerment and potential. If we think what the web does is unleash potential, the possibility to be an entrepreneur, the possibility to create. Um, and so one of the things in addition to Firefox OS that we've decided is that we need to look at those skills, those coding skills, those digital literacy skills, really as a fourth literacy. And we went and asked in that survey about that, both parents and teens agreed, it's that important. And so in addition to continuing to work with Firefox on the desktop, in addition to building out a mobile operating system to bring forward the values of the web into the mobile environment, we've also decided that we really need to champion this idea of digital skills as a fourth literacy. So Mozilla has set a goal for itself, and this is what I want to ask everybody here at Campus Party to help us with, and we already have Telefonica's help in working on this. We set a goal for ourselves to teach everyone how the web works, to feel that sense of knowing how to shape their digital world. So we want to teach everyone how the web works, and a key strategy in that is to do it using everyday internet culture. And so, unsurprisingly, that's where SpongeBob and Psy come into the story. So when I think about my kids, and somebody's asked me yesterday, you know, what is it that inspires me most right now? This is what you know, they watch as much as I watch Gilligan's Island or Three's Company or, or whatever. Right? This is mainstream culture. And fine, like big deal, right? He's a pop star from Korea. Maybe it's interesting that a Korean pop star becomes popular in the West, but you know, he's a mainstream guy. 
But the interesting thing for my kids is not just that they've switched from, from network television and MTV to YouTube, which they have as a, a main part of how they you know, consume media, but that equal to Psy, who itself is a mainstream medium phenomena just on YouTube, mainstream medium media for them is this, right? Minecraft Psy, or this NASA Psy, or this Obama Psy, or actually I guess it's both Obama Psy's. Um, and so the idea that remix, mashup, stuff created by other young people, stuff that's not created by people who are ever gonna be pop stars is my media world and that I can create it is for them real and native and normal. And to me, that actually is something that we can exploit if what we want to do is move that 3% uh, to 67% gap. If we want people to be able to understand how all the code works, to be able to understand they can shape their digital world, it's to start by saying you actually already know how and you exist in a world where you and your peers do shape the digital world. And part of it is because the web itself is, you know, this culture exists because the web itself is designed that way. It really is a set of Lego that you can look inside, understand, and play with. And so, you know, this is actually still quite literally this. And that is how Tim Berners-Lee and other designed the web is as an open system that I can go inside, understand, read, study, take apart, and reshape. And that's a part of the web to me that I value, that I think sometimes most of us don't think of every day, but is actually a part of creating that culture of invention, innovation, and entrepreneurship. That anyone can shape it and change it without asking permission from anyone else. So what Mozilla's decided to do, and we just decided this earlier this year, is to kind of tap into the mainstream of internet culture being about creativity, making, and remix, uh, tie it to the remix idea that you can change it, really that we live in an open source culture, and use that to teach the world the web. And that's the thinking behind Mozilla WebMaker, which is something we uh, launched earlier this year as a, as a pilot, and that we also work closely with Telefonica and others on. So let me finish before I bring up the young entrepreneurs from, um, from Think Big to talk about what is we're doing and invite you all into it. Because this idea of teaching the web that we have is something that is as ambitious or more ambitious than beating Microsoft and taking the web back, and is going to require the same kind of community effort. And the good thing is, I think it's going to be fun, uh, so you'll want to get involved. So the, the way we talk about this goal and the level of ambition, and this is Mitchell Baker, again, somebody I really look up to as one of our founders and a great social entrepreneur. And when she kind of helped craft the vision for WebMaker, what she talked about is moving tens of millions of people from using the web to making the web. And I think we really have that in our fingers when you think about how internet popular culture works. It is about people re realizing they have those skills and then getting better and being able to do more with the web. And so that's, the, that's what we've called out as wanting to do. And so we've launched WebMaker to do that. If you go and see it today, there's a bunch of people who work on it. You'll find it quirky and, and odd and probably maybe even a little hard to figure exactly out what it is. But what it is is a place where people who are making remixable, hackable internet content can come and actually share with each other or learn about how it works. There's lessons there. There's ways that teachers can use it. So it's really our place to kind of create an umbrella and a magnet for this idea of hacking and learning the web. Uh, and it's really just a kind of stake in the ground in many ways. And the kind of things that you'll find there, and this is something that we're doing together uh, as a part of something called Think Big Studio with Telefonica, is giving people popular content specifically they can remix. And so this is Heat Magazine. How many people know about Heat Magazine? So the other half of you aren't British, I guess. Um, and so you know, Heat Magazine, popular with young people, the idea is, create a Heat Magazine cover that you can go and remix in HTML, um, and there's a competition both to win an iPad and I think also potentially to get in the magazine. And so the idea is we've made these HTML versions of the, the cover, these web versions of the cover, using that WebMaker technology, working closely with Telefonica and, and Think Big, 
and are bringing that into the Think Big Studio stream and the Think Big program as a way uh, to get people starting to hack the web. And that's just an example of the kind of approach that we want to use, taking popular culture and inviting people in. And so if you went right now to that page, uh, you would see that kind of pre-done, fun, heat page. Uh, but the in invitation there, actually if you saw the published version, is just hit remix. And it brings you into an HTML editor with instructions on how to edit it, which is really teaching you, or there is a teaching aid to walk you through. And this is some kids came over fr from Campus Party, some Campus Arrows, uh, and this is the page they made uh, by just remixing it. So it's that simple. What we're trying to do is throw stuff up on WebMaker that walks you through playing with popular culture in a way, or whatever you want, playing with cooking, playing with soccer, playing with whatever, in a way that exposes you to the nature of the web and the technology behind the web. Uh, and as I, I then went actually and hacked their hack page, as you can see at the top, you can still win an iPad if you remix this page. So I'm inviting you to come and do that. So that's the kind of stuff that is the thinking behind WebMaker. Some other things that you'll find there, and this is going to be a growing and growing collection, is something called Popcorn Maker, which lets you hack with online video and layer stuff on top of it. So this person just took the uh, main Psy video and threw other uh, Psy animated GIFs on top as a kind of a joke. But in doing that, I start to learn how media pieces across the web work. And as I also create a video that is very web-like. I can view source. I can remix it. And a thing that we're, we're in a very early phases of pre-pre-pre-alpha prototyping over there is something called AppMaker, where you can very quickly, as in this case, uh, you're seeing a demo of grab some standard functions and make an HTML5 mobile app uh, and then publish it to your phone. So here we just made a, a fireworks app in the t amount of time that it took me to describe that. But the idea is that you could make a custom chat app just for you and your friend to talk to each other, a custom uh, to-do list app that just you and your uh, partner could use, whatever you can imagine. We want to get to the point where the world of apps is as malleable as the world of the web. And with HTML5 and the ideas that we're pushing into the mobile world, there's no reason we can't have that where everyone is actually an app maker. Uh, and i just show you a little bit some of the, the roadmap on that just to give you a sense that we're moving from the basic stuff you see there today with WebMaker to the idea that by next year or into the following years, we're democratizing not just uh, showing people how to code, but democratizing uh, the whole way that the app e ecosystem works, which in the end, I think, will be the real difference between the web on mobile and the two dominant operating systems today, is if everybody can make an app, there'll be such diversity that that'll actually become the platform of choice. And that actually goes back to the market argument for HTML5 on mobile. But anyways, just to wrap it up, the, the other really important piece of what WebMaker is, is it actually is really just people teaching people. Those tools that I showed you are there to kind of draw people in, but a lot of it is building this movement of people who are just going to teach each other the web. And so this summer, we threw a thing called Maker Party. Uh, it's almost wrapping up. And there were 650 events around the world where people are teaching each other with tools like the ones I, I showed you. And you know, it, it's really simple stuff. When I say teaching the web, it's not like university professors sitting on stage, highly trained for hours on end. It really is stuff like we've got over in Building 6, uh, where we're running a Make the Web Zone with Telefonica, and you can see all of those other awesome partners we're working with, it is people just rocking up with a laptop and saying, hey, try this. And that's probably something all of you could actually do if you wanted to kind of spread the idea of teaching the web. And when you think about just that kind of simple teaching, and you can see some folks here are hacking on the heat pages, it's not new. Uh, it may, and also, it's not new, and also it may seem small. Like, how are we going to move tens of millions of people this way? And like, is that really that fancy and all that kind of stuff? And I think we can move tens of millions of people, and I think we can do it in a really compelling way by engaging people around their own lives on the web and the content they already care about. You've already heard me talk about that idea. But one of the reasons I think the ambition is possible is we have seen it before. And you know, that is not dif that different than something like scouting. And if you think about scouting, here's an here's a idea that 
actually, I'll, I'll just ask this one last question. How many people think, or who could name what do you think is the major social innovation that scouting brought to the world? Pardon? The pup tent? Hunting. Oh, ca wait, you already know. You're not allowed to say. So Helen is right. Camping, but specifically civilian camping. So obviously people camped for you know, a long time uh, before the scouts came along, but it was an arcane technical activity. It involved heavy, expensive equipment. Nobody in the city would do it. And Powell's vision really was to expose ur urban young people to nature. And he took this arcane technology and this difficult skill and actually mainstreamed it. So, you know, how many people are professional campers right now, or have been? Not ri Richard's not allowed. Uh, did they have tents on the naval ships? But, and how many people have camped? And so it's possible to imagine us moving from an arcane skill to something that is incredibly fun and popularized at a massive scale by teaching each other how it works. And that's the vision that we have with WebMaker, with the work we're doing with Think Big, with what we think is possible with the web. And we think that that can open up tremendous opportunity for people. And of course, uh, if you think about the scouts having done that, growing to 40 million today, it's not that hard, given the camping metaphor, to imagine that Campuseros, oh, sorry, to imagine the Mazillions are a part of it, but also that Campuseros are people who we want to bring in and invite to be a part of that. So with that, uh, I invite you to come over to Building 6, where there are free smoothies, but also you can play on that uh, Thimble project and hack the Heat magazine uh, and win an iPad. You can learn about Firefox OS. You can get a bunch of other coding lessons and entrepreneurship lessons with free formers and other folks who are there. And if you're really keen, you can test out this very early Mozilla App Maker concept. And maybe even, if you're really geeky, help us develop it and grow it, because uh, we think it's something that's going to change the world. So thank you. And I'm going to pause. Uh, and I'm going to invite up our Think Big entrepreneurs. And we're going to talk about what role the web has played in the work you guys do. So come on up. Ah, perfect. Thank you. So hi, guys. Do you, got the, do you have the mic? Or do I have the mic? Where's the other mic? She's got the mic. We need that mic. All right. So we have uh, Anne-Marie, Anne-Marie, Hannah, and um, Cyril, yes. right? Uh, and you guys have all been involved in the Think Big program. And for people who don't know, how many people have heard of Think Big who aren't wearing white t-shirts? Right. So Think Big is an umbrella uh, that is, is a really kind of amazing initiative that Telefonica has, covers a lot of different things, but really is about youth and empowerment and entrepreneurship. And these guys, you guys have all gone through the Think Big program where you've come with your own idea and being able to make it real, and I guess different levels of it. So we want to talk about that and the role that the, the web plays. And so maybe we'll just go from that end, like, you know, <laughs> what are you doing today in a little bit because of Think Big? Okay, um, hello. So I'm Hannah. That's Hannah. Um, my project, so I started with Think Big about a year and a half ago after university. Um, a friend told me about it, and I ran an event which is to encourage children to go outside more. So it's like a digital platform. So with the money and the support from O2 Think Big, I ran an outdoor event last summer. Um, we had 2,000 people turned up, and it was like a big outdoor event. Um, and now I'm just in the stages of building the prototype um, with the Think Bigger Award. So that's where I am now. Awesome. And Anne-Marie, what are cool. you doing now? Um, so I run the STEMETs. Uh, we're an organization that run panel events, hackathons, and exhibitions for girls to introduce them to women that work in science, technology, engineering, and maths. So with the Think Big um, support that I got in March, I ran our first panel event. So we had a load of women, some who worked on the Shard, some who worked on the Hadron, Hadron Collider, some who were in technology. Um, we had the Freeformers lady, actually, as well. Um, and then with the Think Bigger, we had a hackathon um, in August at the Barbican, where we had 60, 75 girls learning how to code over a weekend. And Cyril? Yeah, my name's Cyril. Um, my company's actually currently filming Make the Web, so <laughs> hi, guys. <laughs> hi, guys. Um, yeah, currently, um, 
we're producing visual content for various companies, um, not just in the UK but abroad. Um, Think Big helped to give me the insight in terms of the entrepreneurial element, um, the mentoring support, and just the general friendly nature of the whole team. So it's been a great plus being part of this whole campus party project. And, and so you guys are all, like, were any of you technology people before? Yeah. So it's kind of the range. Yes. And like, what was it about Think Big that kind of made you made it possible to get there? Right, it's not a huge amount of money. It's not like, you know, what what was it that changed in you that kind of got you the steam to do these ideas? I think for me, a big part was the resources. So a bit like you said, the support of actually giving me those laptops for those girls to use. Um, and also Stephanie, who's in the audience, um, who's my O2 mentor, helping me to think through things kind of outside of the project as well, kind of sustainability of the project. Um, but also some of the tools that we were given as well. So I was able to use some of the Mozilla, um, the thimble that we saw earlier and some of the other stuff as well. So I think what it is, is it's helping you to help others and to build your project. Right. Whereas if it was just me running the event, it's kind of, you know, why are people going to turn up? If right. think bigger behind me, then clearly it's a good idea. So it's the mentoring and the teamwork and all of that. Yeah. I was just going to say that it's the exposure, I think, as well, isn't it? About um, they sort of give you the platform to be able to then talk about it. So for Twitter, for example, my event last summer, um, that went on to OT Priority um, as like free goodie bags and stuff. And it's just the their backing, which helps, like Anne-Marie says. Cyril? I think for the level one, um, the website was really influential because the milestones on the website ensured that you were able to see the progress that you were making um, as a project. So once that was ticked off, you could speak to your mentor to find out how your next milestone was going to be achieved. So definitely by having that website, it ensured that we were able to keep track of progress and see our actual progression. Awesome. And maybe one last question, and then we can throw it out to the audience to, to interact with us, is like where, I guess when you look out at the world of technology today, like what is it that, you know, what role is technology playing in where you're trying to take these ideas? And where are you kind of hopeful, or where is it maybe even less hopeful? I don't know. Um, I think as a visual content company, um, with technology being so accessible via mobile or tablet, it means that you're able to share your your work to the world instantly. Um, once you have a decent following, within seconds, the minute you post it, it just goes out. And if it does have the buzz, it can become viral and that could lead to various opportunities. It also means you can see the competition very early. So it <laughs> means if you see a new competitor doing something similar to you, maybe you adjust your USP or you decide maybe we need to change our format. So I think it just opens up the space for everyone to share their ideas and also see other people's ideas as well. So transparency and openness. Yeah. Um, for me, it's really about the creativity and the speed at which you can create things. So I, I remember some of what you were saying earlier and kind of looking at the, the source of HTML pages to understand how this HTML tags and then being able to build stuff myself and being able to do that with the girls as well. They can see how quickly they can create something that someone else might benefit from. So I remember Hannah brought her sister along to one of our sessions and her sister then wrote her birthday card in HTML. <laughs> you know, after an hour, it was like yeah, an hour that an hour, we spent yeah. um, learning HTML. So it's doing that and then being able to see that it's something tangible that is just as real as the websites that they go on every day, which I think like you're talking again as well about digital literacy there's a big part of that now with the tools they're helping younger and younger and people that typically wouldn't have been interested in technology helping them to see that this is something that they can really be a big part of creating awesome hannah um all i was going to say is um about social the social good side of technology about how it reaches out to more people now so with my project the get out explorers platform is to encourage children to be more active outdoors. So obviously it interests them in the fact that it's social, leaderboards, competitive, challenging, but it's the fact that you can reach them in something they're actually interested in and they can use it there and then. And it's just so widely accessible rather than just being lo in one location. So Awesome. Yeah. yeah, and I think those are all things that for us are key values and why we want people to see what the web can be for them, right? Whether it's that openness or that ability to take a social idea and just run with it or certainly that creativity, I think, are core to what the web 
offers people. And the, the thing that we're trying to do now, it'd actually be good to use you guys a bit more as a focus group with the Think Big Studio program, which the Heat Magazine is a part of, is can we actually, you know, I don't know, it's hundreds or thousands of people who've gone through that Think Big program, look at tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of millions of people feeling those first ideas about creativity and then maybe going further to the stage you guys are at. So I want to say thank you to you guys and, and maybe throw out for questions if people have questions for these guys about the web and entrepreneurship and the, the stuff they're doing or about this kind of general idea of getting involved in this whole movement that Telefonica and Mozilla are, are helping to drive forward. So do we have a separate mic or you need to run with the mic? Okay. It'll be complicated. So are there people who have questions? I know it's a lot of weird mix of content. Go up there. I've got a question for Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, my name's Bridget. I was really impressed with what you're doing about encouraging young women to get more interested and involved in technology. So I have a number of nieces who are young women. What top tips can, can I give to them about why they should get more involved in technology and the things that you're doing? It's going to come down. I'll make Jeopardy. Do, 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 do. Um, I think the tool, oh, was it on? A lot of the tools that Mark showed, um, get them on that. There's tutorials as well. Are you kind of techie? Yeah, so get them making. I think that's the biggest thing. We've got Sophie here as well, who won our hack, and you can talk to her as well. Just kind of see, in just such a short period of time, what they can actually create. Often, that's all you need to sell them. And then they're off, you know, they've built their fashion empire in their mind already, or they've built their, you know, their version of Angry Birds. And it just goes from there. It's kind of, I, I didn't even know until today that Hannah's sister had taken one hour of HTML coding and created something for her sister. So with girls, a lot of the time, you just need to give them kind of the tools and how to make it, and they can already see the world of possibilities of what they can create. So I'd say that. I'd say definitely join our mailing list and follow us on Twitter. Um, <laughs> pardon? Stemets. Yeah, so we're stemets.org. Um, and we're on all good social uh, networks, so everything, you'll find us there. But they can follow that as well to see kind of up-to-date resources and also women that are doing cool stuff around the world as well within science, technology, engineering, and maths. So things like today, um, who knew Lego have launched a new uh, figurine, and a women scientist Lego figurine, which you can awesome. go out and go and buy and add to your, to your thing. You never know who that might inspire. So we, we do put out a lot of stuff as well. Um, but I'd say definitely role models is quite important. And I think that, I just want to ask you to tell maybe another story that you were telling me before, because that inspiration piece of just being able to take what you can imagine once you take that first step seems to me something that links you guys and links Think Big and what we're trying to do. And you told me the story about the girl who didn't know about a Tamaguchi, but then made yeah, a Tamaguchi. Yeah. I so think it's a hack, funny, it's a yeah. good story to... So our, our hack winner was an eight-year-old called Adja, um, who built my pet dog. Um, but she's eight, so she doesn't know, but she built a Tamagotchi basically over the weekend. And mum says she can't have a dog, so she made her own virtual dog um, that you can take to the cinema, you can take on walks, you can take on the stage and the dog performs. Um, but you also get, you can also feed the dog and you get 50 points when the dog um, when the dog eats or when you feed your dog. Um, but of course, she has grown up in this world where you don't have anything without advertising. So she built advertising in her, into her game um, and because mom says she can't have a dog, she sponsors a dog. So she scanned the card of the dog and put that as an ad into the game. So after a while, you can then sponsor a dog. And that's the ad that comes up in the game. And, you know, if we'd have had a week, she'd have built, you know, <laughs> I didn't, the, dog, the dog went to the space. The dog went everywhere. She would have built so many more things for the dog. But it's amazing with the creativity and just that small kind of, you can do this. She just went nuts with it and built as much as she could. And maybe while we look for another question, you want to pass the mic back. The, I guess the, the, the thing that really that story inspired or reminded me of is, you know, it's great that we're trying to do things like create GCSEs for computer science or do things in the school, but it, what, it's like that impulse that's in most kids, like that girl wanting a dog, that actually is, I think, the fuel of teaching this stuff at a, at a scale and what you guys are doing. It's just like that's just so there for us to leverage, I think, in kids. Other questions? We'll sit here uncomfortably until somebody asks us a question. Richard has a question. So, Mark, fascinating chat. And, uh, yeah, Mozilla, a really impressive story, and everything that's done with Firefox. And uh, 
um, the web is impressive. So what goals do you set yourself? I mean, are there areas from the, the, the competitions you've run worldwide, are there areas where countries where people are better at uh, learning coding earlier? I mean, culturally, I mean, clearly this is a language, it's a digital literacy that's, that's got to be learned. Um, I suppose two questions. What, what are your targets? So how do you know when you've succeeded? And, it, and how do you get there? Because the education system doesn't teach it correctly. Um, yes, it needs to adopt, but it will take ages to adopt to teach it correctly. And yet the opportunities that my kids or whatever don't have because they haven't got that skill is huge. But it, it, it's how do you get to that tipping point of this becoming viral? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, the kind of abstract target that we would have, and I guess I'm interested for you guys to think about as well, like where, and in particular, Emery, in your case, because we're on the same track in some ways, but for all of you, like what does success look like for each of you? But if I think about, you know, our case, it really is something, I guess two, two things, maybe on the one level, that stuff that has the kind of properties of WebMaker, so the ability to change or hack an app, the ability for people to really um, learn by taking this stuff apart and put together, is as popular and mainstream as a YouTube is today. And so the, the idea is really to build those properties into mainstream social media. That's the level of ambition that, that we've got with this. And we're still, I mean, there's a guy uh, talking about kind of Google and failure on a stage earlier today where he showed, you know, their open social and then pr I don't know if anybody remembers Google Wave and then, you know, there are various phases before they get to something like Google+. Plus. I think we're still in the early phases of figuring out how do we make being enthusiastic about not necessarily learning to code but creating things that require those skills as a really mainstream desire in society. I think we're still in the early stage. We're working, you know, with the dozens or hundreds or thousands of people like Anne-Marie are trying to go at the same thing around the world. So we're still in the early stages of that, but I think it's that level of an ambition. And I think how you do it is tap into that eight-year-old girl who wants to make a, have a dog, right? Is what the internet does for all of us is open up dreams and potentials and connections and things we want. So how do we tap that at the same time as having the goal of people understanding what the real power of this thing is to shape the, their lives uh, and to make the world better. So I don't know, what do, if you guys reflect on that, what does success look like in your sort of social ventures? Um, I would say success is um, being a well-known brand. So as big as O2, as big as the Apples, as big as the Googles. Um, nowadays, it's not as hard as before to gain that exposure. You just have to have that unique selling point that everyone kind of relates to and can can see why the growth is there so it's just the growth really that's that's what kind of drives the whole team on awesome i think for me um so I'm, i've got almost a subset of mark's mission so when we look at females within technology they're only 15 percent in the uk around the world that that number varies but here they're very much in the minority coming up like i said i was in technology i've always been interested i was always one of the only girls in my computer science class or on my degree um, so for me, my personal objective is to kind of raise that a little bit more. We're 50% of the population. There's no reason why we shouldn't be 50% of the industry. And something that's so important, as you said, and is going to be more, more important, it, it's not fair that all these girls are kind of sat at home thinking, oh, no, that's for boys. This is, this is not for me. So for me, it's going to be 50%, I guess, across the industry, if we zoom down into what I can actually track um, and what I can actually influence. It's 50%, at least, of the girls that come to my events we are able to track them and say that they do go into STEM. So if it's not technology, it's engineering or it's something in maths or something within science. Um, so that's my goal and having them kind of recur and having these kind of girls going off and doing that stuff on their own time without me even knowing, that's basically, you know, so for me, the hack was completely worth it for this eight year old who can now, who's now built this Tamagotchi. The time I spent, the sessions we did um, where Hannah's sisters came, for me, that's it, right? She's now coded HTML thing. I wasn't even there. I didn't even know. If I didn't see Hannah today, I wouldn't have known. But that small seed has now grown and become something. So for me, that's what success looks like. Just changing those mindsets a little bit. Because as you said, it is all in your mind. It's something you can definitely do, but you have to almost be enticed into doing it. Um, 
So that's kind of the roadmap and oh, how I, I, for me, technology is exciting. Like it's not, it's difficult. It's not like maths where you have to almost try and sell it. If you just show somebody that they can code something, the eye, the eyes that you can kind of see that eureka moment on their face where, oh my gosh, I've built an app. It's on the internet. I'm, you know, they feel as if they are literally Mark Zuckerberg. Just that moment is enough. Um, and that's what I'm going for with, with all the girls. Awesome. H Hannah? Um, I think I would echo what Anne-Marie was saying with um, the children going off and doing their own thing or just young people generally. So for mine as the platform, it's mainly user-generated is how I want it to be eventually. So children go out creating trails, creating activities, uploading it, sharing it with their friends. So it's when they take the idea and run with it. So I'll give them the platform and I'll give them the tools. And when they come back or go away and I don't know about it, like Anne-Marie says, and then they do it for themselves, and that to me is success, is when they start to use it. Yeah. And, and I think maybe we'll take one more question, but one thing that I heard in what both of you are saying, and, and in some ways in all the stories, but, you know, in the end, I, I think really one of the things that all of us are looking for is giving people that sense of agency and empowerment, right? That they, it, it's really just a matter of that small switch that says, I can do this, right? And that is actually something I think the web has a, a real potential to make people feel, but only if we you know, do stuff with it like that. Uh, and it really is that giving people that sense of agency and empowerment. So maybe, is there, is there one more question out there in the world? Christian Heilman. It's like all of the, the people in the audience who uh, have been planted. Not really. Um, I just had an idea about why don't we fight more dirty we're showing the greatness of the open web and we're showing how easy it is to remix things, but then we don't republish that in open platforms. Like AppMaker could be easily packaged up as an iPad application and sold on the, uh, on the I iOS market. Like seeing that lots of kids, their first impression is not going to be a machine that has the web, but it's going to be an iPad that the parents put in their hands. It may be about time to actually start thinking about putting WebMaker projects into closed technologies. Do you Anne Marie want to respond? <laughs> that is a really good idea. So this guys that made Scratch, there's someone that's now developed something called Hopscotch for the iPad, which is basically the same thing on the iPad, but yeah, you're right. And for a lot of these kids that is their first um, it's not a Raspberry Pi necessarily or even a computer. Their first thing is the mobile phone they have in their pocket or the iPad that mum and dad say you're only allowed to use three hours a day. So if we can put it on that platform, absolutely that would be that'd be it. Let's make it happen. Yeah, no, and, yeah. and I, I agree, and I think it is it is a sign of, to kind of bring it to, back to the original theme, it is a sign of, of a real entrepreneur. It's what I admire in you guys, I admire in Mitchell and Brendan, is you know, being able to take your vision that you want of the world and being able to be pragmatic about what's actually going to make it real. Uh, and I, I think we do need to do that uh, in some way, Christian. And Anne-Marie, if you want to help, we'll sign you no, up. Why not? So uh, do you guys want to say, maybe I'll just start with Hannah, just like a last word. And I guess the, the question is, especially for people here who are Camposeros, if they have their own idea or they want to kind of take something forward, what's the kind of, just a piece of advice for the world? And knowing that people are also watching on video on how to be an awesome social entrepreneur. Not too much pressure. Um, I would just say that there's the tools out there and obviously the web is huge now. And if you don't know something, then just go online and find out about it. Like for me, I didn't know anything about web design or mobile design when I left university and I pretty much taught myself because the tools are there. And the same with coding, I'm about to do some sort of Makers Academy Anne-Marie is introducing me to for coding. So I think the tools are out there if you look for them. That's what I would say. Um, first of all, I'd say if you're a female in STEM, come and say hello. <laughs> we need you at our events to help out. Um, but also as a social entrepreneur, if uh, as long as you work out loud, I think things will come to you, opportunities will find you. Um, give it a chance. If, you, if you're if you trying to make something happen, give it a chance. Get on Twitter, get on blogging, use the web as much as possible, as Cyril's been saying, kind of, you're global now. Once you get online, that's it. Everyone can see what you're doing. So use that um, as much as you can um, to get your idea out there because then you'll find similar communities and other people that are trying to do the same thing. Um, attracting, getting in touch, and kind of together, you're able to build community rather than just with you on your own. Um, I agree with that statement. I also believe being proactive is very important. Um, finding people in your circle or people who share the same ideas and visions can always help elevate your idea and concept. Um, 
And once people see your vision, you almost become magnetic wherever you go. Whatever idea you express, people understand it. And then you're able to kind of create your own little movement, which always grows. Social media has proved that via Facebook and Twitter. So that's what it's all about. Awesome. Yeah. And I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more. And I guess you know, my, my advice is, is similar to all that, which is you know, if you have an idea, especially if it is about kind of advancing some of the kind of causes that Campus Party is about, just starting up and doing it is something that isn't that hard to do and can have tremendous impact. And the, the really inspiring thing about Campus Party, this is my third Campus Party, is you know, it is filled with people who already have that attitude. I think the opportunity we have is to really grow that into something that can get to the scale of ambition that we're all talking about, where 50% of, of the tech industry are women, or where it really is mainstream to have technology that you can take apart and put back together and, and play with. Um, this is a group of people who can do that. And so if you see yourself as a part of that, and you don't already know about going over to Building 6, uh, come over to the Make the Web space over the next couple of days. As I said, there's a, you know, if you want to just learn the very basics of HTML and how to code, like Richard's still got to do, uh, you know, come on over. There you go. You guys definitely have to come over and, and make a Heat Magazine page. Uh, and then, you know, even at the other end, and I think we really would love to find some people uh, to come play with this, if you're interested in, in say, like as Anne-Marie is, teaching other people, come and play with our really early app maker stuff and critique it and help us figure out what it should be because we're really in the early phase of that. Or if you're a coder and want to actually help build that, uh, maybe port it to, uh, to iPad after we figure out what it should be, uh, then come on over and that piece is on the, the top floor uh, of Make the Web. But there's then everything in between. So come on over uh, and there are free smoothies, uh, as you may or may not know, that should get you in there and get you wandering around Building 6, which as you can see from that photo, uh, looks like that and is just right outside the main entrance. So thank you guys very much. Give these guys a huge round of applause. And thank all of you. And also, special thanks to Helen uh, and everybody else on the Think Big team who put this together and also made that amazing Make the Web Space happen. So huge round of applause to you guys at Telefonica who have been amazing partners. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank Cyril, you. Cyril, Anne-Marie, Hannah. Thank you for the great session, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And actually, you come back to you. I just want to tell you guys something about I'm not going to tell the whole group. Uh